Where are the students? I was requested to address students of uh, this famous school. There are all the students sitting here just at the back. So uh, I'm not going to speak a lot. Uh, I'm going to only raise a few issues because we don't have much time. But before I go further, I'll tell you one thing. I used to teach at the university, law students, over nearly 30 years ago. Uh, but I also know that students get tired. I think there's already information fatigue. So I want to uh, give you some homework to do before I start. Uh, but I tell you one story. There was a famous lecturer uh, who was requested to address a meeting like this one. He gave a long lecture. He had about four PhDs. And he gave a long lecture for only one hour after about five speakers had, had spoken. So, uh, after he had spoken, one person was left in the room, only one person, and he asked this person, and who are you? Did I impress you so much with my speech that you have remained here all this long and you have been listening to me attentively? That gentleman, unfortunately he was a gentleman, not a lady. Do you know his answer? He said, no, it, are not, it is not me who was so much interested in your lecture. I am the next speaker. What do I mean? Everybody had left the room by the time the gentleman had finished his lecture. And the only person who was in the room was the one who was going to address the room. I mean the audience. But there was nobody to address. So, students, if you want to walk out, you are free. But the topic I was given has been already addressed by the students. I have read your resolution. I have read... Uh, I have also read your strategy. And as I, as I did yesterday, I commend you. I commend you for having internalized all the speeches you have been making and turned them into practical reality. And therefore, you have already written a lecture for me. This is enough for me. But it's not enough to, and I've read your documents. Do you want to replace the United Nations with another body? Or do you want merely to improve the United Nations? Question number one. If you are able to answer that question, you can lay the necessary strategies. You will have your objectives or the goals. You will have the activities you want to carry out to achieve that goal. You will identify who is going to carry out those activities. And what indicators will you show that you have carried out that of those objectives? I have seen you have got outputs, but I do not see the risks involved in this strategic plan. So basically, you have started well. After answering that question, I will ask you, can you amend the United Nations Charter? Is it possible to amend the United Nations Charter? If so, under what provision of the Charter, or under what 
environment. Do you know, uh, do you know Article 18 and Article 19 of the Charter of the United Nations, which allows the General Assembly to go to the Shooter Council to amend the Charter and requires that all permanent members must agree. Do you know that? You must have two thirds majority of the General Assembly members and all permanent members of the Student Council. Do you know that? So, what is the problem? The second question raises the problem that it is a difficult task to go through the United Nations. Because in the United Nations, you have the veto. The veto of the five members. Is it five? Permanent members. You know them? Can you count? China? Next? Huh? France? Alphabetically. Next? USA? What about UK? All right, all right. That's homework. Those powerful bodies who, when they slaughtered their, their animal, or they killed an animal, they took the lion's share. Say, that you people, you never fought much. Give us all this meat. You just remain with a few bones. And then why? Because they say they are powerful. They must retain all the power and keep it for themselves. Up to now. So, handle number one, in, in using the United Nations to change the, the charter, is the veto. And yet, that is exactly what you want to change. You are ready? You are ready to ask a question? So, what is my suggestion? What is my suggestion? What is my suggestion? Let us try to improve the United Nations. Let us use the structures of the United Nations to create, if possible, a world parliament within the United Nations or a more representative general assembly. And let us expand the Security Council to include more members and let us make the voting in, in the, in the Security Council democratic. So first approach. Second approach. I think Dr. Gandhi would have been happy to hear the second approach. You children, you have suggested let the world leaders meet. Who is going to call this meeting of world leaders? Who is going to be the champion? Yesterday I joked with Dr. Gandhi that, are you really going to be the champion? You have tried it. Can you succeed? But he has to continue trying. We are even trying now. So, the strategy of calling a meeting of world leaders is for me the best solution. Why? I want a meeting, a world conference on peace and security. In December, there will be a world conference on climate change. Last month, in the United Nations, in the United Nations there was a meeting of the United Nations on sustainable domain goals. Why can't we have World Congress on Peace and Security? Outside the United Nations, why can we not use civil society as pressure groups and regional organizations, AU, European Union, ETC, as, regional as, as pressure groups to feed in into this World Congress on peace and security. So, is this dream achievable? That's my last question. Is this dream achievable? 
Homework is given to you. What is my answer? Yes. Not today. Not tomorrow. But when we have created sufficient world momentum and, cre- and, 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 and world consensus, To legitimize our vision, our ideas. Hence, the continued advocacy for this grand idea. We are not working in vain. Some of you know that recently China, I mean Cuba and America showed their differences. We have now diplomatic representation. Who knew that China, I mean Cuba and, and, and America will be friends? This is in the Bible where it is said that there will be one day when the lamb will sit on the lamb on, 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 on the bosom of a lion. The lion eats the lamb but the time will come when these are friendly. So, whatever was looked not possible is now looked impossible is now possible. And we say, in, as Christians, we say, for men and women, what is impossible is possible with God. So I live with those thoughts. I live with those thoughts. And as I said, we need now to move forward, concrete proposals, to live rhetoric. And so, that's my homework. Next time I come, I believe you have solutions. So I, I wish you I wish you success in your studies and may God bless you all. And my care, it's there. So now children will be able to come and ask questions. Children, three of you, please come to the front. We will first take three questions. Are you addressing your question to... Yes, so please face him. All right. Good evening, sir. My question to you is, what has the government of Uganda and other African nations done to promote the level of education and enhance it in your continent? And are your measures and steps effective enough? Thank you very much. When I went to school over 60 years ago, because I'm now 72 years old, primary education and secondary education were not compulsory. Ten years ago, primary education was made free and compulsory. Secondary education was made free and compulsory after uh, eight years ago. So all children are supposed to go to school and are not supposed to pay anything. So the enrollment, which was uh, at that time two million, is now seven million pupils in schools, in primary schools. Secondly, private, private schools have dominated too much, like CMS. They are now almost surpassing public schools. And this has improved access to education. We have over 28 universities in Uganda. So higher education also has been liberalized by private universities and 10 public universities and about 15 private universities. Public universities is where government pays. Private universities are those those who can afford, may I say the rich, even the poor, who like good schools. <laughs> so, have I answered your question? Yes, sir, my question is answered. Thank we you. We have improved a lot of access. I'm not sure about quality. Quality is something which has to be 
developed all the time. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Uh, my question is, uh, sir, can you share any experience of yours in which certain cases have required unorthodox actions? Uh, sir, I, uh, what was the reason of the crime or something? I'm asking that, can you share any experience of yours uh, in which certain cases have required um, unorthodox actions or orders? Okay, 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 okay. All right, all right, all right. Any common e e examples? I tell you a funny case, which I decided. We have a, a group of people called Seventh Day Adventists. They pray on Saturdays. So these were university students. They said, "We don't want to study on Saturdays. We don't want to, to have exams on Saturdays." Tell all universities that we must not study ourselves and close all, all classrooms on that day. We said, "Really." you think that is possible? Is that very fair to other students? You are, you are, we know we are very few. But we, we think you are entitled to repress your religion. So we said no. We cannot close all schools on Saturdays because of religion. Because we don't close schools because of that reason. There may be other reasons. And then we said did you agree to come to this university? He said yes. You signed? He said yes. But there are other universities for your, which respect that Seventh day Adventist University. Why didn't you go there? So no, we can go to any university in Uganda. The decision was that if you cannot start on Saturday, then you must be able to miss that day and get notes from your students. Or, if you miss an exam, you may have supplementary exams. We call that principle, principle of accommodation. The students should not be uh, 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 you should not miss going through education because of that of his inability to study. So, we said the university should try to accommodate the students by giving them extra maybe extra uh, exams or if necessary they can have uh, remedial uh, uh, courses thank you sir my questions answered good evening sir so my question is so whenever international court of justice passes any decision so uh, passes any decision there is no executive body to see that the judgment is followed by the country like in our country, the opposition sees actually ensures that the judgment is being followed by the uh, by the, the uh, ruling part. Ruling part. So, sir, why aren't the other members of United Nations ensuring that the verdict is following the decision? You see, some members of the United Nations themselves are also not following decisions because they are big. So, they cannot have double standards. If a small person does not follow the decision of the International Court of Justice, they just look aside. Yeah, because they have no interest themselves in following. They are too big, they don't want the bread to be their policeman. They don't want the bread to give them orders. So, if, if you, the International Court of Justice makes an, a decision and you, 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 the country ignores, it just lies down there. So you use other mecha mechanisms, like a negotiation, using third parties, using uh, other methods, whereby you can ensure that uh, at least you come to settlement, arbitration, or a uh, third party, which is mediation. Bring people together and say, please settle this matter, or come to some agreement. That's why the, the permanent court arbitration is there, and that's why the international arbitration is there. Because at least there, everybody, you don't have a winner, everybody, is, you don't have a, a winner and a loser. We get everybody to be the winner. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. May I invite Justice Fernandez to please speak on the theme, 
for a little bit about the rights of children, the international instruments, etc. And then we will request three other children to ask questions. Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon, students. Kisi ho. And forgive, forgive me, I cannot speak Hindi. I will try to do my best in English. I'm very happy to be here in Lucknow, in your historical and, and rich city. And I need to correct my friend Justice Odoki, but I have a good piece of news for you. I'm going to be the last obstacle between you and the end, between uh, you and the end of the day. And this announce, I, I think, demands a clap. Clap your hands, please. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, talking seriously, I, I, um, I work as a civil judge in my country, in Argentina. Argentina is in the extreme south of the continent of America. I work also for a judicial organization that deals with uh, judicial training for judges. Yes, kids. Sometimes uh, education for adults is necessary and important, and that's what uh, we do in my organization. In this moment, in City Montessori School, re recruited by my organization, we have colleagues from different parts of America. And following the example of my colleague from the United States of America, and, follow, and using sports, let me tell you that soccer in this area of the world, in America, in Europe, and I guess that also in Africa, soccer is very important. And I will, will use that, that tool. We have people from, judges from Brazil. Brazil is famous because of carnival and, and, and soccer. Do you know uh, Neymar, the player from Barcelona? He is from Brazil. He is from Barcelona. We have judges from uh, Colombia. Colombia is here in this area. Colombia is famous because of coffee. And let me tell you that coffee replaced in Western world tea when the British could not export any more tea from these lands to the West, the West began to consume coffee. Colombia is the land of coffee. We have judges from Ecuador. Ecuador is a little and beautiful country in the middle of South America. Quito, for example, is a historical city, a colonial city that used to be occupied by the Spanish. The Spanish are for this uh, area, this um, zone of the world, like the British for, for India. Quito is a wonderful place. We have people from Paraguay. Paraguay is in this area of South America the land of Guaraníes. Guaraníes are the natives of Paraguay. Talking about soccer, uh, perhaps some of you know Roque Santa Cruz. Roque Santa Cruz is a player that used to play in Germany, in Bayern Munich, as far as I remember. Does that sound familiar to you or some of you? More or less. Okay. We have judges also from Peru. Peru is in this area of South America, is known 
for being the land of the Incas, a very strong community in South America that had left a very important legacy in terms of our, um, architecture, archaeology, and culture in this area of the world. We have people from Uruguay, too, also a land of soccer, and tango. Tango is the music from Uruguay and from my country. In terms of soccer, coming back to Barcelona, the, the, the powerful team of Spain, Luis Suarez is a player from that country. And finally, we are judges, some of us are judges from uh, Argentina. Argentina is the land of soccer too, tango, Pope Francis, the mayor authority for the Catholic world uh, in the world, is from my country. And he is a strong fighter for the peace. Last but not least, since I'm using soccer, and since soccer is very important in our country and in our world, let me show you the team of my sport, of my the t-shirt of my my team. This is River Plate from Argent from Argentina, from South America. The let me tell you about this t-shirt that is also very similar to the one that represents national Peruvian team. And have you listened about the World uh, Championship for clubs? It's going to take place on December in Tokyo, Japón. My team, hopefully, is going to play against Barcelona. And we are proud of that situation. <laughs> so... <laughs> we are here we are here and we uh, are strongly committed to the issues uh, that compose the agenda of this conference we are happy to be here and we are committed to the idea of the um, basic principles of the Child Convention of the UN, and we are committed to the idea of generate improves in these systems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, very, thank you very much. I will now invite three of our children to ask questions from Justice Fernandez. Very good evening, sir. Good evening. So my question is that the right to education is the most highly, widely recognized rights. But still, millions of children in many countries are deprived of this right. According to you, what is the reason behind this? And who should actually be held responsible for this? Thank you for your question. It's a very uh, complex and intelligent question. I, I, let me tell you that I, I do not uh, know exactly the, the answer. Uh, however, however, and this is only uh, an example of what it could be uh, an interesting tool. In some countries of uh, this area of the world, in South America, uh, education is uh, taken, taken by duty for the states. And it's a good quality uh, system in general terms and reasonable. This, this is a, a good example of, of a possibility. However, this is not enough. However, this is not enough. It could be a, a possibility. Honorable Justice, my question to you is, first of all, knowledge is one of the greatest forces that can shape one's purpose. Understanding is one of the most precious gifts a human being can possess. 
how can education be used as a means for nurturing thirst for knowledge and attraction to beautify to the benefit of society and the upliftment of human conduct Sh shall i read your question because I, I, there are some some new things number number 4 interesting and, and complex questions thank you i do not know exactly i could say i would say simply that the 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 most knowledge we have the most information we have about different issues in our mind the most different people that we meet from different areas of the world and this is a wonderful aspect of your school the more open that's your mind the more open that is your mind the better person you are going to be in, in the future so this is my my reflect my poor reflection in this respect <laughs> thank you sir good evening sir my question is that how is media civil society and education playing a prominent role in advocating good moral or ethics to the children shali shali media is uh, is media is only a tool the 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 power of the me the consequences of the of the media is uh, strong in terms of diffusion but this is is a tool it, 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 but uh, but sometimes also as a judge is 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 interesting and important to to call the attention of the media because that make the situation uh, get known by by the general public thank you sir thank you thank and don't forget about my team <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much I, thank you <laughs> i thank the respective our uh, respected uh, chief ju judges yes please sir huh? and uh, the time is actually the time is up for this session i also thank the children my apologies to the children that i cannot take any more questions okay but uh, we will have chance on tomorrow and the day after as well as on the 12th there are more sessions where you can be asking questions tina and answering the questions of the children thank you very much indeed <laughs>